Ladies and gentlemen, خانم ها و آقایان و دانشجویان عزیزم My darling students who have joined us tonight How wonderful to see so many old and I hope some new friends of the Center for Iranian Studies and for Iran Society who have joined us this evening My name is Nargis Farzad I'm the senior lecturer in Persian studies at the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at SOAS and the current chair of Center for Iranian Studies. Tonight, we are delighted to host the Iran Society who have organized what will be a splendid conversation between an old SOAS colleague and friend, Professor Ali Ansari, before St. Andrews University snatched him away from us, <laughs> and Tom Holland, the award-winning historian and fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. The full introduction of our two distinguished guests will be given by Anthony Wynne, the chairman of Iran Society, who I'm sure is known through the rather wonderful number of Iran Society members who are here tonight. I have not been privy to the ideas that Ali and Tom may discuss tonight. <laughs> but when I think of how the Persians could have had a much more conspicuous presence in the world in perhaps a little less invidious way than currently done, I think of the letter that Frederick Engels wrote to Karl Marx on 6th of June, 1853, from Manchester. Engels had been trying to learn Persian, it seems, and with palpable excitement, he tells Marx in this long letter that Persian is as close as can be to the langue universale tout trouvé, the universal language if ever found. Imagine how much larger my classes would be in, <laughs> in such a utopia. I now invite Mr. Anthony Wynne to tell you a little more about our guests tonight. Thank you very much, Nargis. Um, the Iran Society, of which I chair, we're extremely grateful to SOAS for a allowing us to use this room this evening. Um, I'd like to congratulate you all for coming in so punctually. Um, the last time I had to get a large crowd in was in Istanbul. There were 600 Scottish Highlanders. <coughs> we had to move them from the reception room to the dining room, and the chef was very temperamental. said, you've got to get them in on time, otherwise the food will be cold. Now, you try moving 600 Highlanders. You know what we did? We got a belly dancer. <laughs> so, can we, we couldn't afford a belly dancer this evening. But anyway, so thank you for coming in on time. Uh, now, this evening, we've got uh, two people here. We've got Ali Ansari, who is a member of the Council of the Iran Society. Nargis is also a member of the Council of the Iran Society. The Iran Society, for those of you who don't know, was founded originally in 1911 as the Persia Society, it was then refounded in 35 as the Iran Society, and we've been going pretty much ever since with the odd gap for um, wars and things like that. Um, and what we do is uh, we, uh, in, we promote the knowledge of Iranian history and culture and art and architecture and archaeology and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, but we do keep away from contemporary politics simply because there are plenty of other places for that. So this evening we have um, in the blue corner Ali Ansari, Professor Ali Ansari, Professor of Modern History at St Andrews University. He is, for those who don't know, he's the go-to man for radio and TV when they want an instant comment on Iran, Ali Zuman. He's the author of Modern Iran, um, The Politics of, of uh, Nationality, and he's all written the book on uh, Iran, a, a short introduction, and he's got another book, um, in, in a work in progress. And he uh, joined up with Tom Holland on a radio programme which you probably come across called The Rest is History, which had a fascinating conversation which uh, lasted 15 minutes, but it had I don't know how many thousands of followers. Um, 
and uh, which gave the idea for this meeting. So that brings me neatly on to Tom Holland, who needs absolutely no introduction, thank goodness, because his Wikipedia entry extends to six pages. <laughs> um, but suffice it to say that he is a polymath. His principal interest in life, or was, dinosaurs. Um, which, well, that, that, that'll bring us conversation, I think, can come from that. Um, radio programmes, TV documentaries on classical Greece, the origins of Islam, ISIS. Um, but the thing about his books, if you haven't read them, they are immensely accessible and really good, rattling good yarns. Um, and the book that's brought us about this evening is his book, uh, Persian Fire, which has a rather disparaging Greek view of the Persians, which Ali Ansari might help him to put right. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Anthony. And, and um, I, we were told as we were coming in that we're going to have to sit here with microphones. If for any reason this slips, do, uh, do alert me. And for those of you, I'm sorry, who are sitting on this side... I will try and turn regularly, obviously, Junior and Sirius, to see you there, uh, to make sure that you're not ignored. Now, there are two uh, small things that I wish to just start the evening with. One is to just uh, a little bit on the semantics. It is what have the Persians uh, done for us. Uh, obviously, in, uh, I'm using the term, and we are using the term Persian in its, in its European sense. So it's, we will, you will find that we will use Persia and Iran interchangeably throughout the, the discussion. So British please, Sea English. That's right. Similar yes, kind of. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So we don't want to. We Iranian don't want to, Sea Persian. We will. We will. But it, it's it's it's. It, but you you might also find that we're spreading a little bit further in the Persian world. The other thing for those of you who have listened to the superb podcast that uh, Tom co-hosts. Uh, we probably won't be able to reach all the many and varied contributions that the Persians have made to world civilization. So if you're disappointed at the end of this, I do apologize. We only have a limited amount of time, as I had actually on the podcast. And I'm still waiting for part two, and he won't let me get back on for the next. <laughs> but in any case, without further ado, I want to continue. Uh, we're going to kick off now with, uh, with Tom is going to, to lead the conversation, uh, really about how we... Uh, see Persia's contribution to, to wider civilization. Now, I wanted to ask you, Tom, first of all, I think, you know, Anthony sort of hinted at some of these things, that you've obviously had a great interest in Iran and, and Persia. But how did this develop? Well, well, he, and he said that, it, that, it, that Persian fire had a very uh, negative take on the Persians. I, I don't think so at all. I, I think I make the case, um, certainly in the introduction, that um, Persia is at least, if not more, as influential on uh, world history as as Athens. I mean, certainly more than Sparta. But I should say that talking of Sparta, I mean, this is how I first became interested in Persia. It was as a boy, um, and I'm afraid, Ali, that yeah, um, this is it. Yeah, Not all the, the darkest of suspicions of the yeah. Iran society will be confirmed by this. So this is um, a book called The Armies of the Greek World, and this is an illustration by Peter Connolly, and I adored it, and I must have drawn it a million times. Um, and I became obsessed by the great drama, um, as told by Herodotus, of the Persian invasions of Greece, first under Darius, um, the expedition defeated at Marathon, and then 10 years later, the great invasion force led by Xerxes, who, who wins at Thermopylae, which um, this is showing, um, and then defeated at Salamis and Plataea. And for me, as, as a young boy reading all this stuff, I, I was completely on the Greek side. I totally bought into the idea of Persia as an evil empire. Um, but what changed my, uh, what, what, what kind of started to muddle it for me was actually reading Herodotus because I became so obsessed by it that I realized that if I really wanted to get to grips with this story, I was going to have to read a Greek classic. And it was the first classic I'd ever read. It was the first time I'd been in our local library that I went to the kind of the grown up section. And what struck me when I read Herodotus and astonished me was that actually, Herodotus was often incredibly complimentary about the Persians. He, he admired them. Certainly um, is. This, I mean, it's a, it's a much more, there's a lot more mutual respect than I think the, uh, yes. the, the popular history would allow us to think, really. Well, I mean, Herodotus was a subject of the Persian Empire, and it's evident that he, he knew aspects of it quite well. I mean, he has this, you know, this famous line that um, the Persians teach only three things, to, to shoot the bow, to ride a horse, and to tell the truth. And it was that telling the truth that kind of stuck with me. And so 
Um, one of the things that always I, I came to wonder about was, well, why is there no Persian equivalent of Herodotus? Um, as a child, my assumption was, well, how ridiculous. The Persians didn't write history. No wonder we have to, you know... <laughs> no, too, too, no busy, wonder too busy we, making we, it. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, uh, yes, uh, making it. But then I think um, basically kind of emancipating themselves from it. Because this, is, this was the conclusion that I came to, was that actually what makes the Persians distinctive in the course of world history and why their impact it has been so seismic, is that they are the first people, I think, to cast a vast global empire in overtly moral terms and to say that um, their empire, in a sense, is an end, the end point of history. So long before Francis Fukuyama, I think the, the Achaemenid kings had, a, had come to see their empire as embodying the end of history. And to illustrate this, this is the exception that proves the rule. This is really the, the kind of the principal Achaemenid Persian na narrative that we do have. And it's authored by um, the guy on the far left, uh, Darius the Great, who is standing on um, a prostrate foe, who, according to Darius, is a liar king. It's someone who pretend, who's pretending to be of royal blood but isn't and has been smoked out by Darius. And all the, uh, the guys in front who are kind of tethered and cringing before him, they are also liars. They are liar kings, which obviously establishes Darius as the guardian and the teller of the truth. Now, the, the, the reality may well be, I, I suspect almost certainly is, is that Darius is protesting too much and that actually he staged a coup and that the king who he claims is a liar was in fact the legitimate king. But uh, what Darius is doing here is casting himself not just as the, as the rightful true king, but as a king who is de a defender of truth in a cosmic sense. That, that the order of the Persian Empire is synonymous with, with the truth that is locked in a great cosmic battle with the lie. Light and darkness, good and evil. And that sense of um, an imperial order that can define itself in those terms is obviously going to be hugely, hugely momentous. And that's why I think this is such a kind of a, a, a crucial text, because you start to see all kinds, just like kind of little, little acorns being dropped that you know will grow into huge trees inscribed on, this, on these texts. So... There is a, um, a people called the Elamites who keep breaking out against against Darius's rule, and Darius ends up so impatient that um, he condemns them for not worshiping Ahura Mazda, the great god who um, the, 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 who embodies truth and order and light and everything that Darius is identifying himself with. He condemns the Elamites for not worshiping them, not worshiping him, and that's a really kind of radical. So it's, it's, it's not so much just, and I think this is a very important and distinctive point, I think, which you've raised before. It's not simply this idea of, of, of constructing universal empire, but universal empire based on a moral order a in moral which order. good and evil are very clearly yes. defined. And so what you find is, a, is an empire that's not founded on the principle necessarily of, of force, but of authority, which I think is quite a distinctive sort of achievement and maybe contribution. You would yes, and, and that, that essentially... Um, if, if Darius is launching punitive expeditions against barbarians, barbarians in distant mountainous lands, then it's, it's for their own good and it's for the good of, of the moral order of the universe. And so actually when I was writing Persian Fire, the Americans were, were getting ready to launch their campaign in Afghanistan, a mount, remote mountainous backwater. And it seemed to me very clear that actually the line of descent from the ancient world you know, it was it was the Americans who were the Persians. Yes, that, you know, it wasn't the Americans were not really playing the role of the Athenians in this battle, however much they might pretend to. And the reason why um, the, the, the the Persian kings abstract themselves from history is that after this, Darius and his his heirs are able to cast themselves as um, as kind of figures of absolute <coughs> moral power. They don't. There is no place for personality. There is no place for history because the Persian Empire is the embodiment of everything that 
that is good and true and 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 and, and correct. Um, and those who oppose him are agents of darkness, agents of demons, agents of the lie. And, and this this reflects a, a Zoroastrian ethic, in a sense, a new well, the, uh, the, a new the, type of faith. So the question of whether the Darius and and, mm. and the Achaemenid kings are Zoroastrian is furiously debated. I think probably not, because I think the idea of a Zoroastrian kind of institutional structure is, is much later, but it's drawing on these traditions. And that, that kind of dualism, which is so kind of fundamental to the way that the ancient Persians see the world, and which is so influential, it, of course, on, um, on, on the Jews, on Christians, on Muslims, I, I, I think it's that that this stands as a kind of, almost like a kind of buried spring from which all these great momentous globe changing religious traditions rise from um, and you, and you, again you know you can see it in this because not only is um, is Darius condemning the Elamites say for for failing to to worship his god and, you know and by the standards of the age why should they I mean you know it's not a Persian god the Elamites worship their own gods I mean that that would be accepted but you see there a kind of glimmering of crusade and jihad just a kind of foreshadowing but um but you also get darius promising his troops that if they fight well then you know essentially they will go to heaven and again you know these are very very momentous straws in the wind i think um you see and them reflected in, in obviously the other great religions that uh, that, that 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 emerge well, yes and of course uh, not that we want to claim the Persian well, origins of all the Abrahamic faiths, but let's go for well, it. Well, ex 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 except, the, I mean, you will know uh, that um, the, 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 the king who reigns um, two, two ahead of Darius, Cyrus the Great, um, he is hailed by, by Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah, the as, 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 yes, as, as the, the anointed one, the Christos, the Messiah. Um, so the, 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 the portrait of the Persian kings in, in the Old Testament is a very positive one, um, and I think reflects the way in which trace elements of Persian influence are definitely to be found there, and over the course of Christian and Muslim history as well, you know, that, that sense that, um, that dualism answers many of the problems that an all-powerful, all-good God presents to, yes, ex to, to religious believers, that is a way out. Expla explains the origins of evil, basically, yeah. I mean, in that sense, yeah. in a much easier way. I mean, I think the other thing which I find quite striking about that sort of uh, uh, faith system, in a way, is that the Persian kings and the Persians as a whole, um, in, that, in that religious view, they are part of a struggle for achieving Ahura Mazda's aims, in a sense. They're not simply the playthings of the gods. They are part of the process of trying to achieve the good order. And good. Now, how you define good and evil is, a, is, is, is another matter, clearly. The king does that. But on the other hand, it's quite an interesting, uh, I, in, I would say certainly interesting contribution that the Persians make to that longer sort of sense of yeah. uh, universalism, that, that ability to define a moral order. And I think explains why the Greeks and the Persians so often seem at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. Because for the Persians, the idea of gods who just lie as a matter of course, which the Greek gods do, of course, it seems incomprehensible. And likewise, when you read Herodotus writing about the Persian devotion to truth, he's framing it in a kind of a Greek way. He doesn't properly get a handle on what, you know, the cosmic significance of, of the idea of truth for the Persian kings. So there's, you know, there's a very kind of fertile but inevitably kind of... Um, it, prone to kind of generating miscomprehension in that relationship, I think. Um, and the, 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 these, these Persian religious traditions will, again, because of their influence on the Christian and Muslim traditions in the long run, when you trace back f fairly fundamental notions like the idea of, of, of time having a direction, time having a purpose, that time begins and it ends, um, which is very contrary to the way that most ancient civilizations understand the nature of time. I mean, that's pretty fundamental. So you could say that the idea of progress is ultimately a Persian idea. And certainly the idea that, um, you know, eschatology, the idea that the world will come to an end, um, 
So you could say that uh, you know our panic about climate change is Persian as well. So well, uh, I mean, it's all because up, of Ali. because of uh, because of our interest in uh, in green issues, which we'll, well come on to later. I think. Well, I think we should come yeah. on to them right or now. Or should we come on to them now? I mean, yes. the Persians are yes. yes. Ah, yes. here we are. Some so, some very fetching footwear. Uh, so and so garden. the Persians, the Persians would be very worried. You know, the ancient Persians would be very worried about climate change because they loved their gardens, didn't they? they? Did. They, they loved did. their gardens. And so when, um, uh, according to Herodotus, when Xerxes' advisors were trying to persuade him to invade Greece, um, the clinching argument was to say, well, there are amazing plants there that you haven't got. <laughs> and Xerxes goes, brilliant. There's a, there's a tree he's after. Isn't <laughs> yes, there? Yeah, that's right. kind of he's plants. Going... And there's this amazing story about how he's approaching Sardis, the capital of Lydia, you know, with his, his, his invasion force, and there's a plane tree of such exquisite beauty that he hangs it with golden ornaments and sets guards on it. Um, and this is what inspired, you know, over a, a, a long process of, um, of uh, repeating the story is, is what you get in Handel's great opera, you know, the great aria about Xerxes falling in love with the tree. And it's, it's, I mean, I, I, I picked this slide of the, of, of, of the, the walled garden in, in a way to at least give that impression of how significant this sort of ordered sort of uh, Well, yes, because is. What, is, what, is the, uh, what is that walled garden called? Yeah, well, yes, uh, paradise. And yes. there you are in paradise. Well, paradise is a Persian word, and obviously we uh, like to think it's Persian in origin, but uh, <laughs> maybe not in destination at the moment. But uh, the... Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the idea being that it's a sort of a, a man's, I suppose in some way man's, uh, uh, not dominance, but certainly uh, engagement with nature in a way. That's well, much the, more the, the, by um, the, the freeze on the previous slide of, of the king fighting, uh, I think yes. it was a lion, wasn't it? Um, well, it's sort of the beast of some sort, isn't it? The previous, the previous, previous slide, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, here. Yes. So this is at Persepolis, and it's meant to be a beast, which is sort of, that's the, that's the sort of the lie. So there is the idea that, the that nature has to be termed, but yeah. tamed. So tamed. that's with the, the beast, but with, with, with plants and with... Um, that's right. With, you know, this is... And, and the king casts himself as a gardener. So there's mm. the, um, I, the I'm anecdote. a very keen gardener, by the way. I just want people to <laughs> be aware. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't yeah, no, doubt I'm it. Not. But there's the, the famous anecdote of... Um, uh, Cyrus the Younger. Yes, that's a great story. Who gets visited it. by um, a Spartan um, and gets shown round um, his paradise again at Sardis. Um, and the Spartan compliments um, Cyrus on the, the, the expertise of his, his slaves. And Cyrus says, no, no, it's me, mm. my, my green fingers. And that's that, that idea that um, he's the shocked, world isn't he? he's is shocked. A he is, he's Spartan, shocked. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, but, but the idea that the world is a garden mm. to be tended, I mean, that's very much uh, an idea that... Um, well, I, I think the Persians can make a claim to being the first environmentalists, to be honest. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's... Uh, I, I, certainly so they, that. They, 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 had, you know, they, they were much more connected to nature, and I think they, they, they understood the power of nature. I think... Uh, I don't know whether we're going on the right-hand side at the moment, but... Uh, well, do you want to go on so, to... So, well, you, so, so you said... So, so something else that the Persians have offered the world yes. is their incredible sense of fashion. Yes. Very so, great. Um, yes. The, the, the Persian kings were famous for their platform heels, and high heels was obviously a tradition that passed down the many centuries because it, 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 um, it became an influence in the 17th century on European fashion. It I did, think, it? it did. And of course, um, one of the reasons, and th those are much later, you'll be pleased to know, those are not our community high heels. These are uh, actually Safavid, but they, it, it's basically because of the Persian um, uh, love of horseback riding and therefore these high heels would enable them to sit comfortably and with the stirrups. But these then become a fashion accessory really in Europe uh, by the uh, uh, by the 17th century and become part of the, the fashion that's brought over from Persia. And we use that word Persia very deliberately because Persia, of course, in the Western imagination in this period, is is something that's it's both familiar and slightly exotic. So it's got a certain cachet to bring things over from Persia and to adopt Persian fashion. But I think you, you get a sense, right, going right the, again, right the way back to Herodotus, that um, the Persians are very keen on wearing the correct footwear and... It's they not just are. about the riding. Unlike the Kaiser. For those Unlike who, the Kaiser. For, for those who follow the Unlike podcast. Unlike the Kaiser. Yeah. Um, but the, so there's a story that when Cambyses, who is the son of Cyrus, who dies just before Darius stages his coup, 
that when he conquers Egypt, he um, allots uh, a, t a town each to one of his sisters, which are responsible purely with keeping the, the royal sisters in suitable footwear. So imagine, imagine, imagine being given a town and their entire job is then to provide you with shoes. <laughs> Sensible policies and the, and the, for a the, happier, the other, happier Persia. The other major, major fashion uh, uh, innovation, I have to say, is the trouser, yes. which I, I'm very pleased to say, which I'm glad to say most of us are acquainted with. And, uh, uh, and of course, but the trouser was seen, was it not by the by Greeks, the Greeks. And the Romans, as, as effeminate or something? Hilariously like? effeminate. Yeah, hilariously yes, effeminate. Yeah. hilariously effeminate. Yeah. Um, yes, so um, you oh, know, a why? Greek coming here would yeah. would be appalled by <laughs> the unmanly quality of our dress. So, um, so th I think that's another way in which the Persians have have influenced our. And there we have uh, meads. Obviously, the meads are the ones that bring in the, uh, the leather the trousers. trousers. Leather, and then there's a Parthian prince for those of us who are interested in Parthians. Uh, so yes, with some very good uh, leather chaps. As so well. these are all great. These are all the, um, you know, the, 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 the springs, the, the kind of small streams that over the course of the centuries and the millennia have become mighty flowing rivers of mm. influence. One other, which um, before we move on from the Achaemenids into um, more recent times, is slightly darker. Uh -huh. So um, oh people dear. may recognize this as the Marquis de Sade. Um, the Marquis de Sade saluted the Persians as the people who had most expertly mastered the art of torture. Um, and he derived this from classical texts in which the Persians were, were celebrated for their ability to kill people in very refined and, and, and sophisticated ways. Um, and the, the, the Romans, of course, who were incredibly famous for crucifying people, um, they, they blamed the Persians for having given them the idea. I, I have to say that um, when uh, Tom was writing his uh, book Dominion on the uh, influence of Christianity on, on, on the Western imagination and Western consciousness, he said to me, he said, you're going to like this book, he said, because uh, I'm going to send you the introduction. It starts with, with Darius and it starts with the Persians, he said. And I got very excited and thought, yes, <laughs> Zoroastrianism is the foundation of Christianity. Of course, the chapter opens with crucifixion. And the, uh, and the way in which the Persians had basically, or, or certainly the Romans felt that the uh, Persians had invented crucifixion and this was a, a particularly uh, vile method of, uh, such a vile method of, of, of killing someone, it couldn't have been a Roman invention. Yes, that's right. But anyway, so, so the Marquis de Sade, big fan of Persia as well. Um, so, so lots, you know, going right the way back, the ancient beginnings of so much that, that we take for granted. Um, well, I mean, and I think the Marquis de Sade is a good, well, I, I, probably not the best segue for me, but um, on the other hand, I, I'm willing to take this and run with it, uh, partly as a sort of a, um, a, 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 as a transition to the, to the modern period in a way. Although, you know, one of the things to recap is I think that what we have uh, in the Persian contribution, quite apart from fashion, quite apart from environmentalism in gardens, uh, is I think something much more profound, which is really the nature of power and authority in the ancient world, and also that notion of a moral empire. And I think that's a very significant contribution which emanates also from that sort of Zoroastrian heritage, however much it's a, yeah. it's a much more fluid Zoroastrian heritage. But this idea that even Nietzsche comments on, on the fact that the Persians are the ones who contribute to this idea of good and evil, yeah. um, I think this is a, a profound one which, which many other people take up. And of course, for me, I think one of the interesting things, if we um, go forward, is that Sadly, yes, I don't know why I put these slides up, but it's partly for entertainment. So the, uh, but, the, but it is mainly this, but a bit like Tom, a bit like Tom. So Tom, you know, as he said, he grew up, and I was also very fond of that Peter Connolly. Um, uh, I had that book too, for some reason. So, and it, it's so, 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 so you, I mean, you were born yes. in Iran, but then... Well, no, not born in Iran, in, um, actually, born, born in Europe, but, uh, uh, but basically my, my schooling is, uh, is, is very cosmopolitan, as we said, but... Uh, uh, not so much, I have to say, one of the interesting things about learning about, your, you know, about Iranian history or Persian history is that uh, really for, for, for a long period of time, uh, certainly Persian history was seen very much as a subsidiary of the Western narrative, if you could put it that way. And we were always seen there as sort of bit part actors, really. Um, uh, those on the margins, in a sense. So... Uh, basically there to be defeated, actually, which was a bit of a well, shame, really. I mean, I found that a bit irritating. But, yeah. but, but also yeah. the fact that, that you know, it, the, 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 pro the great project of kind of resurrecting the ancient Persian Empire, the Achaemenid, has, mm. you know, has been a massive scholarly project exactly. for, for, for decades now. 
but also with the Sasanians, the, the great empire that is the great superpower rival of Rome in late antiquity, mm. um, that it gets destroyed by, by the Arabs um, in a way that Byzantium, its rival, doesn't. Uh, and so, th in, in a sense, the process by which the Sasanian legacy survives is occluded mm. because the Persians become Muslim, but, th but their pride in their legacy, the pride in their history, mm. is, is such that, in a way, they kind of do a reverse takeover, don't they? Well, it so is, and one of my favourite my favorite, uh, phrases, uh, uh, and I, I, I never know who to credit this with, but uh, feel free to, is, is that captive Persia took prisoner her conquerors. And I think captive Persia is constantly taking prisoner her conquerors. Um, it's, 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 it's a fascinating dynamic, you're quite right. And I think one of, one of the issues for me as I was going through my own education and my own understanding of Persia's influence in, in world history was certainly this question of the Sasanians and the legacy of the Sasanians, but also the legacy of the Parthians, to be honest. Largely, you know, occluded not only even in mythological and traditional Persian history that we have in the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, that many of you know, um, but uh, also in terms of the rediscovery of that narrative in, in uh, the writing of Iranian history over the last hundred years. Uh, my own view is that actually there's been a real revolution in our understanding of Sasanian history and late antique history yeah. over the last 20 to 30 years, actually. There's a lot more information that's come to light. A number of you here actually have been participants in a number of workshops and other things we've had, which show actually that far from a little bit like this idea that when the Archimedes Empire falls to Alexander, you know, that's the end of it and there's the Hellenization of the East. Actually, you know, I'm increasingly of the view that Alexander was the last of the Archimedes kings. Yeah. You know, Pierre I mean, Bion if you look says, at it, as yeah. Pierre, I mean, I'm increasingly of the view that Alexander wanted to inherit the Persian mantle. And again, you see that with the fall of the Sasanians, that there's a huge influence of Sasanian politics, culture, history, art on the subsequent Arab caliphates that emerge. And, and indeed on, on, on uh, you know, the very fabric of Islam. That's right. You know, yeah, the, 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 absolutely. The, in, in, much in more, the Quran prayer, much more than there people are three think. prayers that are prescribed. But yes. The idea of five prayers seems to derive from Zoroastrian influence. Yeah, that's influence. right. That's right. And 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 basically, because the Sasanian Empire is absorbed wholesale into the new uh, Muslim polity, uh, a lot of the administration, a lot of the attitudes towards government, it all seem to come from that. You know, the Sasanian model that they adopt. I mean, we see similar things, which we'll come to later, obviously, in, in India later, but uh, that's, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of uh, but, but imperial the structures. The, 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 I mean, the influence of Persian ideas of empire mm. and of the cosmos, it, it is, I think, reflected in the way that the, the caliphate emerges. That the, I think so, and certainly in the Abbasid the, caliphate. Yeah. I mean, certainly in the Abbasid caliphate. Very, very I think it's very clear. I think it's very clear there, and you can see the legacy certainly in the first uh, several hundred years, actually, of the early uh, of the early Muslim period. But I think also, I mean, now I guess is sitting here as well. I mean, we can see also the wide influence in language. We tend to see uh, a lot of the time the argument being that you know Persian and New Persian has a lot of Arabic influence, which obviously it does. But I think there's a greater acknowledgement that there's also a lot of continuity between Middle Persian and New Persian. So that influence, I think, uh, continues. And I think it's very influential even in the, in, in the modern period when the West becomes also reacquainted with uh, uh, that Persian history, when they start to travel to Safavid Iran and when they start to reacquaint themselves also with older texts. And a lot of that has to do also with the British in India, the British and French in India, where they start to uncover texts that deal with Zoroastrian and other things. But what I was fascinated with is really that when the Europeans approach Persia, they don't approach Persia as complete... Uh, um, they're not completely ignorant of this, of course. They have an understanding through the Bible and through the classics. But what they then do is they then become also reacquainted... Uh, and, and attached to many of the things that they see in Persia as... A and in India, right? And because in India, Because Absolutely. the Mughal administration in India is Persian. Is, is, is Persian. It's and one of the things that we have to remember is the Persian world is obviously vaster than Iran itself. So the Persian yes. world and the language of government and politics uh, in a lot of these areas, certainly stretching from the Ottoman Empire. I always like to claim the Ottoman Empire, by the way. Any Ottomanists here... Go read Toynbee. He'll tell you it's all part of Iranian <laughs> civilization. But the uh, but the, um, the the stretch of that, the influence of, of, of Persian ideas, I think is 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 very very strong there. And, and and so British administrators who are you know studying Greek in their schools, but are then going out to India and 
are playing the part of Persian civil servants often. I mean, they, they, they're kind of slipping into roles that had been established mm -hmm. and draw on Persian traditions and are, are having to learn Persian well, that's up right. until, you know, Macaulay this is my, this introduces is my English. This is my catch point for those of you who serve in HMG. Uh, it's, um, I was always struck by the fact that, you know, during uh, elections, you know, the civil service goes into Perda. And I always wondered what on earth they were doing going into Perda. But, of course, Perda is a nice Persian word. And, uh, you know, Pardir. So, basically, you're going behind the veil. Effectively, you're going quiet and you're not going to talk about things. Uh, and you won't mention politics. Now, where does this influence come from? This influence comes from, really, from the Indian civil service. And the Indian civil service. I mean, what's fascinating, really, when you look at it, is that Persian, as a, as a, as a language taught to examination level, I think was probably first taught in this country, ironically for the Indian civil service to go out to India and to learn the means and methods of sort of, 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 of government. So many of these British civil servants were learning Persian means of administration and they quoted, you know, the works of Saadi, for instance, in terms of ethical poetry, how it is to approach, you know, the governance of, 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 of peoples. And does this then influence the way the civil service is structured back in London? Could we say well, the I civil think service? So. I think the civil so. service is actually yeah. uh, Persian. I think so. I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, and um, you see, you thought we were being serious. So the, uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, the argument here, and I, I think we can take it a step further tonight, Tom, uh, as a little bit of a bonus. Go for it. I think is that it's not simply the fact that the civil service is really a product of the Indian civil service, which owes its debt to the Mughal civil service, which then owes its debt, obviously, to Persian ideas of government, ultimately to Nizam al Mulk, actually, to be honest. But there you are. Uh, that there is, a, there is a, a strong lineage there of, 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 of debt. But I think also, in some ways, you know, we were talking about the, the sort of the, the, the ideas of the Persian empires and stuff as being moral orders. Moral orders are good and even. You hinted at this also in terms of the Americans in the, you know, in the start of the global war on terror. But we could go back to some of the European empires, too. It seems to me that actually, in some ways, um, the British and other empires were not modelled on the Roman Empire at all, but were no. really modelled modelled on the Persian Empire. Well, so the guy who recognises that was Curzon, ah, who yes, who of who, as a young man, travelled through Persia, visited Persepolis, um, and and was terribly impressed by it. I mean, kind of. He was over He was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by, by it. Overwhelmed by it. Um, and he was the viceroy who was perhaps one might say most like Darius in his. <laughs> <laughs> approach to imperial administration. I mean, he loved, he loved all the swagger and the colour and the. He did. He did, and it also the, the pomp. Well, that's the other thing we can add to. But since we're coming up to the coronation, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, you know Persian concepts of majesty actually, and the the pomp and circumstance that goes with that. Uh, and certainly, the, the the ceremony that we see in this country is drawn really. <laughs> It's quite late. I mean, it's 19th century, and it's drawn very much from a sort of a, you know, the great Durbars of, 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 of India. And these are, these are essentially modelled on, on, on Persian ideas of kingship. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I, I think we can lay claim to that. I, I don't think that's too, too far. I'm, I, I, and I, certainly in this sympathetic audience, I think yeah. I will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Ali, just on, I mean, just on the topic of, of, um, of the civil servant... Uh, 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 of course, traditionally, the civil, the uniform of the civil servant, has been the suit. So, so we uh, we've already identified trousers as this being. This I want to hear actually, because this I'm, I I want to see the suit. I want to see where you get well, the. Well, so, so trousers, obviously, we owe to the leather trousers, That's the right. meads, ultimately, the meads and the Parthians. Uh, and the Parthians. But the uh, the jacket, um, this is also Persian, isn't it? Well, actually, yes, uh, that is true, that the Persian coat was adopted in uh, the courts of Europe century. in the 17th century, yes, and they called it the Persian coat. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's not quite the, uh, you know, the nice suit that we find today, but the Persian coat was definitely, if you look at the distinctive change in fashion from the early to the late 17th century, you can see that something happens, and it follows on from the court of Louis XIV, and then other, uh, other courts follow suit. Yeah. And they call it the Persian coat. I'm not sure how Persian it was, but I'll well, take but it. I, but but in, a, in, a very, in a very real sense... I have come here dressed. You have. You have. Pay my homage, the articulate Persian. My prosthesis. <laughs> I know. To the great tradition of Persia, that the suit is is would be unthinkable without. Um, so without the, 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 
I think one of the things that's, that's also quite interesting is, uh, is why the West and why Westerners were so keen to adopt and absorb many of the ideas from Persia. And I think one of the things that I was working on and discovered really is because it's not simply the, the idea that Persia is, is you know, part of the biblical or the classical inheritance. It's also because in a curious, in a very distinct way, Persia is seen as part of this sort of civilized world and a civilized yeah. world that produces many of the things that a civilized a civilization does, including gardens, of course, but also great poetry. And we're not short of great poets in Persia, are we now? Again? So uh, the, the Europeans were very keen on sort of engagement with the great literature uh, of Persia as a literary the language. Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which leads us nicely into the achievements of science. Nice segue there by Tom. So... Omar Khayyam, of course, who's very much celebrated by Edward Fitzgerald and others as uh, a great poet, is, of course, known in Iran really as a great scientist. And this is another thing that I think the, the, the great contributions of the Persians to, um, uh, to world civilization is in the realm of science, albeit in the classical age, in the medieval and classical age. But nonetheless, uh, as I never tire telling people, um, Omar Khayyam was able to calculate the length of the year to a more finite point I think to a more exact point back in the uh, 11th century uh, that hadn't been bettered until the 20th century, which is quite an achievement for a medieval scientist, I have to say, and something that I think, you know, along with many of the other scientists of that period in, in the Persian world uh, that made quite distinct contributions, not only to astronomy, to, but also to geography uh, and mathematics. So what uh, you're saying is that years of Persian as well? Yeah, it's not only time, years, <laughs> end of time, messiahs, Trousers, let's Suits. go for it. I haven't got to ice cream yet. I'm not going to touch spaghetti, so don't worry about that. Uh, but, can, you, uh, can you not go for ice cream? We can go for ice cream, I think. I mean, I, I have started with spaghetti at the, in the podcast and was roundly told off by a number of people who said this is simply not true. Uh, although, you know, but, I, but, but I, I, I tall sort stories of as well. Because uh, in the Shah Nameh, isn't it the. Um, the uh, the origins of Iran go back 80, million, 80 billion years. No, no, no. That 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 was a no. That was a um, uh, a, a rather enthusiastic, if I may say so, nationalist historian uh, from the early twentieth century who thought he would calculate the length yes. of the uh, reigns of all the kings in the Shahnameh and calculated the length of the kingdom of Persia to be some ten billion years, which as <laughs> which as someone pointed out was far longer than the length of the uh, planet. Well, there you go. Uh, but uh, but obviously, as I said, but obviously as I said, that means that everything originates in Persia. Then clearly. Well, yes. Could, yeah, but uh, yeah, so that that would yeah, tall stories like that. But so anyway, um, I distracted you from ice cream. But ice cream, no, no. I think uh, I think there is a certain amount of evidence for for ice cream. Uh, and I actually think there's a certain amount of evidence for noodles because obviously I, I don't believe Ali, Mar stick to the ice cream. Mar Marco Polo never got to China. Let's be honest about it. He got stuck in Persia and that's where he, um, uh, that's where he went. Yeah, uh, I think we're coming to the final slide, which means that I think, I don't but know. You've just got to tell about ice cream. Well, ice cream, you know, I, I, I don't know much about it really apart from All right, that okay, we invented okay, it. Okay, yeah, okay. that's so right. We'll, 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 yeah. we'll chalk that up. Okay, yeah. So. And, and it's very good. So these, these are actually just, I mean, really to go back, these are, this is from the Chel Sutun Palace in Isfahan, for those of you familiar with that. It's one of the earliest depictions of Europeans in uh, Iran from the 17th century. Uh, and as you'll see on the walls there, which is, is quite interesting, is not only the, 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 the early 17th century dress, but also the depiction of dogs, which is quite interesting for uh, the society, the Muslim society of the time. But it, it shows the growing engagement of Europeans with Iran in this period, uh, trade, politics, um, uh, literature and others, and then basically the, the, the systematic growth of relations from the 19th century onwards. And I think, you know, from then you get to see that exchange, and as I was saying earlier, the way in which knowledge of Persia, knowledge of the Persian language grows exponentially, I think certainly in, in Western countries and certainly in this country. So if we just kind of try and sum up, one of, one of the things that's evident from um, the influence that Persia has had for thousands of years is its geographical centrality, mm. that it abuts all kinds of other major cultures um, and therefore is a kind of a, a, a melting pot. Crossroads. A, a crossroads. Know. I know, cliche, I know all that kind of stuff. But also, you know, as you said, it's 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 also very vulnerable to to it to invasion. Um, but it always seems able to um, to kind of cannibalize 
the culture of the invaders and turn them into Persians, mm. um, and then to export its culture again. So it's a kind of constant process. Um, I, I, suppo I, I suppose modern Iran, in the form of the Iranian Revolution, mm. again, I mean, its influence has been seismic on modern history. I mean, the it has. The, uh, the influence of the Iranian Revolution has been stupendous. I mean, and all the more so, w surprising when you consider that it's, it's not a Sunni country. That's probably because also as a, 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 as a revolution, and I don't, I don't want to get too much into the, uh, uh, the, um, the influences it may or, or, or may not have, uh, but it certainly what it does is it also borrows very heavily from Western traditions, regurgitates it, and then reproduces mm. it. And I think one of the interesting things, of course, throughout history is one of the great strengths of Persian culture has been that ability, that cosmopolitanism that has turned things, taken things, reinvented them and reproduced them and put them out. And you see this right, you know, I mean, Herodotus, of course, says that no, no one is keener to adopt the way of others than the Persians, the Persians you know. Yeah. So you see this continuously, and you see this even in the 19th century as British travellers to Iran say that the Persians are amongst all the pe Oriental peoples the most willing to really explore and investigate and adopt the means of, uh, of while, others. While and, to learn, and, while and to learn. While remaining Persian. Yes. I yes. mean, but, but because that's the astonishing thing when you think about it. The continuities are, are, are stupefying. I and mean, I it think, is possible yeah. to trace the idea of a Persian nation back. It's certainly you know, possible to, to identify a, a sort of a Persian identity, certainly. I mean, going maybe back Armenia to, would be the other. Well, Armenians are really Ar Persian. Ethiopia. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's, um, uh, yeah, we don't want to get. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's part of that. It's part of that wider. China, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, uh, China, well, we don't want to. I mean, there's. there's I but mean, I mean, obviously, yeah. Persia's top nation. I mean, yeah, it is top nation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is. <laughs> taken as red. Um, so uh, basically, big it up for Persia. Woo. I know. I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, I, think the, I think we can safely say that in terms of religion and ideas, uh, power and authority, clothes. fashion, clothes, environmentalism, language. I mean, I think Nargis actually had the best quote at the beginning with the language. And it is quite true. It's a great quote with Marx and Engels. I think Marx was trying to learn Arabic, and he found it very difficult. And Engels said, you should try this. It's so much easier. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think Marx actually gives up with Arabic and says, yeah, I think I'll, I'll go for this. It's, it's um, the, the, the level of influence, and this is for me, I think, you know, one of the most important things, part of my own career, what I've tried to do, and I think what you've tried to do as well in many ways, is to bring Persia, Iran, but Persia, Persian culture, much more center stage in our study of global civilization, yeah. our study of world civilization. For far too long, and I think this is something, you know, as Antti says with the Iran Society, but many other societies that work, the idea is really not to, you know, we don't want, I mean, yes, we have fun, in terms of saying, you know, what, is the, what have the Persians ever done for us? We, we're not saying that it's all positive. It's warts and all. Yes, torture is there. Yes, different and rather gruesome means of execution are there. But I think the most important thing is to sort of understand that Persia and Persian civilization deserves, I think, a much more central focus in the curricula of our, edu our broader education than, than it has hitherto seen. I mean, at the moment, really, it's, we, we struggle very much to sort of see uh, Persia uh, and Persian civilization on a par with you know, European and other civilizations uh, in terms of curricula. So I think that's something that, in terms of our understanding, we would understand the Greek world better. We would understand the Roman world better. We would understand the Western inheritance better. I remember talking to the late, great Fred Halliday many, many years ago and saying that, you know, really, the concept of the West is really predicated on the concept of the Persian Empire. The, 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 the identification of the West and the West comes of age or the, the, the birth of the West is, is really part of a, 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 a sort of a, it's a foundation myth of which Persia is integral to. Yeah, uh, but, 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 but again, complicated because it originates with essentially Herodotus who describes the war of Europe against Asia yeah. despite the fact that Herodotus himself is a Greek from Asia. Yes. So... The currents are, 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 are scrambled and complex and fascinating. They are. They are indeed. Now, I don't know, do we want to, shall we head for if questions? Could, if if, if people, if, if the audience have questions? That'll Although, to be fair, I shall be selecting the uh, questioners. So if I think I you're going to ask me a difficult one, I shall ignore you. Thank you very much. Um, 
no, we, that's particularly for you two over there. We, we have got some roving mics. Um, where, where are we going, Ali? I think we can stop.